uh, started 1 Corinthians 7 last week, and it's a chapter that deals with two very relevant and important issues. The two issues are marriage and singleness. And last week, we talked about singleness, the gift of singleness. And uh, so I hope for all of our singles, you felt so seen and encouraged by the Lord last week. And then this week, we are tackling the gift of marriage, and we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so we're going to jump straight in. And here's uh, what I want to do today. I, I want to take uh, the gift of marriage, and I want us to see it from two angles. Uh, the beauty of marriage is one angle, and then the breaking of marriage is the other angle. The beauty and the breaking of marriage. Those are the two uh, ways we're going to kind of work through our passage today. So first, the beauty of marriage. So go ahead and look at, at verse 10 in 1 Corinthians 7. And I want you just to notice how verse 10 starts. Uh, Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians, says this, To the married, I give this charge. So he's talking to married people. And I give this charge, he says, but then notice what's in parentheses there. He says, not I, but the Lord. Now that's Paul's way of saying, hey, uh, church in Corinth, I am actually not going to say anything new here. All I'm about to do is say what has already been said. I'm just taking the word to Jesus and I'm saying them again to you. That's all I'm doing. That, that's what Paul means when he says, not I, but the Lord. He's saying Jesus has already talked about what I'm about to talk about. So we need to go back now to Matthew 19. So if you want to flip back and we need to see what it is that Jesus said. Uh, when Paul is about to say uh, the next couple of phrases in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he's just repeating Jesus' word. So what did Jesus say? Matthew 19 is where we find it. So in Matthew 19, starting in verse 3, here is what Jesus says. So the text says, and, and the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, uh, that any cause, that, that phrase is coming from Deuteronomy chapter 24. That's where the debate kind of centered, They're quoting Deuteronomy 24. And then Jesus answered them and said this, just, and just notice and observe how Jesus answers their question about divorce. Jesus said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay, so just no, let's notice a few things from this passage. The Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. They're not coming with an honest question. They're coming with a trap. And they set their trap with a question around marriage and divorce. That's uh, the spring in their trap ha had that issue in it, marriage and divorce. And I want you just to notice how Jesus responds to their question about divorce. While they wanted to start the conversation with the ways out of marriage, Jesus wants to start the conversation with what marriage is and why it exists. That's what he wants to talk about. They came wanting to talk about this, and Jesus is like, before we can even talk about that, we've got to see what marriage is and what marriage is for. I've got to show you all the reasons why you should stay in your marriage. That's where the conversation has to start. And to do this, Jesus takes them back to the making of marriage all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. So now it's time to go all the way back to the beginning of the story, Genesis chapter 2. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and, and roll back there. So see what's happening here. Paul is quoting Jesus. That's why we're in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, Jesus is quoting Genesis 2, the story of the making of marriage. So now we're back in Genesis chapter 2. And starting in verse 21, here's what we see in the opening pages of the scripture. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Uh, when I think about this moment, I can just imagine the Lord looking at Adam and saying, okay, Adam, my son, I want you to lay down and I want you to trust me because I'm about to blow your mind. Yeah, there you go. I'm about to blow your mind. I, I'm going to create a helper for you and she will be like you. She's not going to be like a lion. She's not going to be like a cheetah. She's not going to be like these animals you've been naming. She's going to be like you. She's going to be a human, Adam, like you. And she is going to be unlike you. You are male. She will be female. She's going to be like you and unlike you. And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. 
Verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So you see the picture here. God creates Eve. Then like a proud dad, he walks her down the aisle and he presents Eve to Adam. And then like a proud pastor, God turns around and he marries them. He joins them together. This is why Jesus in Matthew 19 says, what, therefore God is joined together, let not man separate. So, so God is the creator of Eve, then he presents Eve like a dad, then he's the pastor who marries them. And then Adam, on his wedding day here, erupts with joy. His heart just explodes. He received his wife with gladness as a wonderful gift from God. Then you get to verse 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Now, what you see in verse 23, it is the first few lines, uh, lines of poetry in human history. I have an African-American friend who uh, calls this the, the first R&B song ever created right there in verse 23, right? Now, what is poetry for? Poetry exists because there are moments in life where prose or just spoken words hit their limit. When you just need more than you speaking simple words. That's why we have songs. That's why we have poetry. Poetry has a way of taking us further than what prose can. And that's what's happening in this moment. On Adam's wedding day, he needs more than simple words. He needs song. He needs poetry to adequately describe what he's feeling inside. Now, let me just pause here and back up and uh, talk to our married folk in the room for a moment. If you're married, Adam in this way is a model for every married man or woman. Adam is praising his spouse. Adam is receiving his spouse as a gift from the Lord. Now, I just want you to ask yourself, is that, is that what you're doing with your spouse, praising them? Is that how you see them as a gift from the Lord? Uh, you know, it's amazing what time in a marriage can do. Uh, it is so often that I bump into couples who rather than seeing the gift that the other person is from the Lord, uh, they see all the deficiencies, all the inadequacies. They just, they can't get to the gift that this person is because all they can see is the negative things. So, so ask yourself, are you receiving your spouse as a gift from God? If not, this would be a great moment of repentance in your life. Asking the Lord to empower what you see in Adam in this text. A joyful thankfulness at the gift that God has given you. Then you get to verse 24. And the first word of verse 24 in Genesis chapter 2 is therefore. Now that's a big word. If you could just imagine for a moment, you're sitting down with Moses and uh, you're watching Genesis 2 play out. Adam and Eve, uh, at, you know, Eve gets created. God walks her down the aisle. He marries them. You're just watching all of this happen. And then in, in chapter, or chapter 2, verse 24 there, with that word, therefore, it's like uh, you're, you're watching it on a TV with Moses. And Moses pushes pause and says, now, uh, before we go on, I need to explain what you just saw. We, we need to define what it is that you're seeing. When God takes two people and joins them together, we, we, need to, we need to talk about what that is, what marriage is. And so uh, Moses here defines marriage, not just for Adam and Eve, but for all time. When, when you think of what is marriage, what is the definition of marriage? The place you should think in the Bible is Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. If you've got your Bible open, you should just write out beside it, Marriage defined. This is where the Bible defines marriage. Jesus refers back to it. Paul refers back to it. This is the definition of marriage. And here is our answer to what is marriage. Therefore, pause. Let me explain it. Moses is saying, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. There's marriage. Uh, Ray Ortland, in his little book, uh, the mystery of marriage, he defines marriage like this. Marriage is one mortal life fully shared between one woman and one man. That, that's, a, that's a good summary of what you read in Genesis 2.24. One mortal life fully shared between one woman and one man. Now, here's the truth about all of our lives. We live in a culture, and the culture that we're in is expanding, trying, wanting to expand the meaning of marriage 
to mean any arrangement between any one or any groups of ones. That, that's our culture, trying to expand the meaning of marriage to mean any arrangement between any one. But that's expanding the meaning of marriage. That is fundamentally redefining what marriage is. And part of what Moses is showing us in this text is that marriage isn't our idea. Marriage is God's idea. It, it sprung from deep down within the heart of God. It's, it's his invention, not our invention. And the one who made it gets to define it, right? Not the ones who enjoy it. But we don't get to define it. This is part of what Moses wants us to see is that God made it, therefore God gets to define it. And here's his definition. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. This new one flesh union is lifelong. It's permanent in that way. It's prioritized over every other human relationship. Hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's the math of marriage. Two people bringing every part of their lives together, nothing withhold, and becoming one flesh. Uh, Ray Ortland goes on to talk about it like this. He says, in real terms, two selfish me's start learning to think like one unified us, building a new life together with one total everything, one story, one purpose, one reputation, one bed, right? All, all sexuality happens right here within marriage, one bed, one suffering, one budget, one family, and so forth. Marriage removes all barriers and replaces them with a comprehensive oneness, and it's that comprehensive oneness, uh, that life fully shared between one man and one woman that separates marriage from every other human relationship. It's what makes it different than just a friendship. It's different than a friendship in that way. It's comprehensive oneness. Uh, that's marriage in the scriptures. Th then you get to verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's what marriage, even east of Eden, e even post the moment of sin being introduced into creation. Uh, this is what marriage is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place where a man or a woman can be fully known and at the same time fully loved, Amen. without embarrassment, without shame. Th that's what marriage is. Now, Paul in Ephesians 5 gives us insight. He, he helps us get all the way down to the bottom of the purpose of marriage in Ephesians 5. Now, listen to how Paul talks about the purpose of marriage. He's going to start by quoting Genesis 2 again, right? This is what Jesus does uh, when he wants to talk about marriage. This is what Paul does because this is where you find the definition of marriage. So Paul says in Ephesians 5, 31, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's Genesis 2. Then he makes this comment. It's going to show us the purpose of marriage. Verse 32. This mystery, he's talking about marriage, the mystery of marriage is profound. And I'm saying that it, he's talking about earthly marriages, that it refers to Christ and the church. So what would we say is the ultimate purpose of marriage? There's some non-ultimate purposes, but what is the ultimate purpose of marriage? Here is Paul's answers. Earthly marriages are metaphors. They are metaphors. They're pictures of God's covenant love to his church. That's what marriage is. This is what it's for. It's a metaphor. Now, this is crazy to think about, isn't it? That earthly marriages, the reason they exist, the ultimate reason they exist, is to paint a living, breathing picture of the eternal marriage. Earthly marriages, showing, showing off, painting a picture a metaphor for eternal marriages. So if you ever ask yourself the question, why is it that men and women fall in love? Why does that happen? Why do people uh, write uh, love songs? Why do romantic comedies exist? Why do lovers spend all of this time talking with each other? Why, why does all of that exist? Why do people throw themselves into that mega commitment called marriage? Why does that exist? And the Bible's answer is, all of those things exist as a signpost. Not to show us primarily the love of the couple for one another. The love of the couple for one another is meant to be seen through. It's the signpost. We're meant to, to look beyond that to the unbreakable, never stopping, tender, sacrificial, gentle love of Jesus for his people and our joyful deference to him. 
That's what marriage is for. This is the reason marriage exists. So every time you see a couple falling in love, every time you go to a wedding, what you are seeing is a reenactment of the biblical love story. Now, that couple may not realize that, but, but they are reenacting the story of the scriptures, that the selfless son of God stepped down into this world, taking on human flesh, living perfectly in our place, pursuing his bride across enemy lines, winning her over, and then promising himself, pledging himself to her forever. That's the story that's being told at every wedding. That's the eternal reality behind every earthly marriage. Adam and Eve's marriage. If you're married, behind your marriage is that, the, the eternal marriage. And friends, this is why Christians stay married, right? Jesus responds to their question about divorce by showing what marriage is and what it's for. And Paul is just saying, listen, I'm just saying what Jesus said. So, so now we're back to 1 Corinthians 7, and here we go in verse 10. To the married, Paul says, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate. That's it's the same word for divorce. So don't read into it our kind of modern conception of like, we're married, but we're separating for a while. That's not what that word means. That word in this text means divorce. It's a synonym for divorce. Uh, the wife should not separate. The wife should not divorce from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Paul and Jesus are both looking at us and saying no to divorce. Don't do it. N no. Why, Paul? Why, Jesus? Because marriage is a parable of permanence. It's a parable of the permanent way Jesus loves his people. The unbreaking way Jesus loves his people. That marriage is designed to say something true about the never-ending, unbreaking love of Jesus for his bride, the church. And part of what divorce does is it tears at the very design of what marriage is. Divorce takes what is supposed to show the good news of Jesus, that never-ending, unbreakable love of Jesus for his bride, and divorce distorts that. It says something false about the love of Jesus. Okay, now let me back up and talk to our married folk in the room. If you are married, you are swept into something that is likely much larger than you think. You have been swept into a marriage, an earthly marriage, that is bigger than just your earthly marriage. It's bigger than just your life, just their life, bigger than just your marriage. It takes us all the way to the eternal marriage. And what keeps Christians married is not our personal wants being met. It's not how fulfilled we are in our marriage. What keeps us married is the desire to tell the world true things about Jesus' love for his church, his covenant love for his church. That's what keeps us married. So part of what we're seeing here is that Jesus and Paul are saying marriage is a big deal. There's so much at stake. Yes, for your kids. Yes, for your life uh, personally. And even more important, ultimately, what's at stake is Jesus saying true things about God's grace seen in the dying love of Jesus. That's what's at stake in our marriages. So if we're married, I think this is a helpful question that we can ask about our marriage. Is our marriage telling the truth about Jesus right now? in the way we interact with one another, serve one another, forgive one another, stay in with one another, allow ourselves to be known by the other. Is our marriage telling the truth about Jesus? Maybe we could ask it this way. Where is it telling the truth about Jesus right now? And where is it saying false things about Jesus right now? Every marriage is saying some false things about Jesus. So the question is not if, it's do, do you see that? Are you turning from those things and coming back home to Jesus, repenting in those areas? Where is it saying true things and where is it saying false things right now? That's the beauty of marriage. Now for the second part, the, the breaking of marriage. The breaking of marriage. Anytime we talk about divorce, it just, uh, it just twists the inside of me because I know how painful talk about divorce is for those who have gone through it. It is the amputation of a limb. 
it, it is just heart-wrenching. And so before we even say anything about it this morning, I, I just want to look at you, if that's you today, and say we, we as a church family, we just enter into that with you, grieve that with you, feel that with you. And, and I'm so thankful that we serve a God who sees all of your pain, knows every one of your tears. We have a God like that, that sees you like that. The breaking of marriage. Both Jesus and Paul want us first to look at the beauty of marriage. That, that's central. That's the ultimate thing that they want to show us is, here is the beauty of marriage. I want you to gaze at it. I want you to see it. This is how big of a deal marriage is. That they want you to see the beauty of marriage. But they know that in a broken world, marriages will break. And although marriage is meant to be a picture of God's never dying love for his people, although divorce tears at the very design of marriage, both Jesus and Paul regulate divorce by giving two grounds that make divorce permissible. Now, notice the word permissible. It doesn't require it, but it makes it permissible. And I want to just work through these two grounds for divorce that Paul and Jesus give. And the first, we need to go back to Jesus. This is Matthew 19. So if you want to flip back to Matthew 19, the first ground is what we just might call adultery. That would be our word to categorize this first grounds that Jesus gives. So Jesus eventually does answer their question. He doesn't start by answering their question. He starts by recognizing the beauty of marriage and pointing them to the making of marriage. But he does eventually answer it. So in Matthew 19, starting in verse 7, here's what we read. They said to him, Why then does Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? So they're just, they're laser focused. The, the trap is set and they want him to answer their divorce question. And he responds by saying this, Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. There is one grounds for divorce in the scriptures. So in the first century, virtually everyone believed that divorce, there, there were biblical grounds for divorce. But the debate was all about what were those grounds. And here's uh, the debate essentially centered on how do you translate and how do you interpret Deuteronomy chapter 24. Uh, it's going to be up on the screen for you, the first verse of Deuteronomy 24. Here was the debate. This verse, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, that phrase, some indecency, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house. So the question is all about what does some indecency mean? And there were essentially two schools of thought. Uh, school of thought number one, this was the majority view, believe that some indecency meant anything undesirable, all the way down to, th think about how crazy this is, all the way down to, literally written in the, the little code here, uh, all the way down to, she burnt breakfast this morning. It's like, we, we got a problem there, don't we? That's crazy. That's the majority view in the first century. Then the minority view believed some indecency meant some sort of sexual sin. That was the debate of the day. Uh, which of those two are right? Jesus answers in verse 19. He responds, or in verse 9 of Matthew 19. He says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So he, he comes down on that conservative minority side. And what Jesus is saying here is that sexual sin so severs the covenant of marriage that it makes divorce permissible. And again, I just want you to hear that word permissible. Although it seems that divorce between two Christians is permissible in this case, it's never desirable. And when it's two Christians, it's never inevitable. It's never required of two Christians. I love what one author says. He says, since all believers have the word and the spirit, they have all they need to bring about not only reconciliation, but in the future, a marriage that sings. That is true, church. Regardless of how bad our marriage is, regardless of what he did or she did, the sort of unfaithfulness that's happened, it is redeemable. Church, if Jesus walked out of the grave, he can rescue and resurrect any marriage. Amen? Any marriage. And we have so many beautiful examples of that around our church family. 
that there's one grounds for divorce, adultery. Here's the second, is the word, we might just categorize it as the word abandonment. And this is 1 Corinthians 7. So turn back to 1 Corinthians 7 now. Starting in verse 12, Paul says this. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord. Now, he just switched it, right? So uh, now he's saying, uh, hey, uh, I am going to say something new here. I'm taking what Jesus said, and I'm applying it to a different situation. That's what's happening now. So he says, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the wife. And his unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, this is our key text, the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Think context. The church in Corinth was a church plant in a pagan city. So you would expect in a situation like that, you're planting a church in a very pagan city, that uh, as people get saved, some of those people are already going to be married. And some of those people who are getting saved are going to be a husband or wife. And in some of those situations, the, the husband or wife, uh, the spouse, is not going uh, to meet Jesus, not going to be rescued by Jesus. So that's the predicament they're in. You've got spouse one who's a Christian. You've got the other spouse who is not a Christian. And they're asking the question, Paul, what should we do here? And Paul's answer is you should remain as you are. That's the sort of theme of 1 Corinthians 7. Remain as you are. Stay in there. Make it work. Serve your unbelieving spouse. Pray for them. Pursue them. Show them the love of Jesus, Paul is saying. And, and Paul says there that the unbelieving spouse is made holy through the uh, believing spouse. That, that's not salvation by osmosis. That's not what Paul is referring to. Uh, that word holy means to be set apart. He's saying that your, your spouse, if you're a, a believer and you've got an unbelieving spouse, saying your, your spouse, your unbelieving spouse has been set apart. They're in a position to see the good news of Jesus lived out in your life to see the worth of Jesus in the way that you live. That they're in a unique position to see all of those things. But, Paul says, if the unbelieving spouse abandons the marriage, even with you serving them and pursuing them, if that happens, he says, you're free. You're not enslaved to that marriage. So, when a, believing, when a believer and an unbeliever are married, and despite the believer's pursuit of them, prayer for them, uh, moving toward them. In spite of all that, the unbeliever abandons the marriage. Uh, the believer would be free to divorce and eventually remarry. Okay, now let me back up. In church history, these two things, adultery and abandonment, those represent the two categories that most people in kind of the Protestant kind of world of church history have agreed upon have been biblical grounds for divorce, adultery and abandonment. Now, I just want you to notice what things are not on that list. My spouse is an idiot. Not on that list. They're a moron. Not on that list. They're lazy. Not on that list. They're irresponsible. Not on that list. Uh, they uh, don't make me happy anymore. N not on that list. Um, I've fallen out of love with them. Not on that list. I'm in love with somebody else. Not on that list. Right? Uh, we don't have anything in common anymore. Not on that list. We just don't get along the way we used to. Not on that list, right? It is a very narrow list. Now, this is the moment when people often will ask the question, what about abuse? So I want to just take a moment to answer that. Um, if that is you, if you're in a marriage and there is abuse going on, first, let me look at you and say, you need to tell someone today about that. Jesus isn't asking you to say in a context that is harmful for you in that way. So let us know, please. Let law enforcement know. Let us know. We'll work that in the right channels. But, but your safety is paramount in that moment. So, so please let someone know. Do not walk out of here without letting someone know. So what about abuse? The Bible doesn't describe in detail all the things that could be abandonment. So just think about this scenario. Uh, could a spouse sin in a high-handed and hard-hearted way? Things like abuse might fit on that list. Things like uh, a long-term deep addiction might, might be on that list. So it's a high-handed, hard-hearted way over a prolonged period of time and with no repentance. C could those things be happening? And could that over time 
mean that although with their lips they are not uh, saying they want out of the marriage, with their life they are saying they want out of the marriage. Could that be true? And this is where we are just so cautious. Uh, We would always lean toward reconciliation. We'd always lean toward perseverance. But we think there can be situations in a marriage where although a person with their lips is saying, I I want this marriage to work, with their life they are blatantly saying they do not want it to work, that they are abandoning and moving out of their marriage with the way that they're operating in it. We say that with so much fear and trepidation, but I think that could be true. If they claim to be a believer, this would require things like church discipline, among some other things. But there could be a time when we would consider them an unbeliever who in that moment has abandoned their marriage. Now that brings up one more question. And it's the question around remarriage. Is the divorced person free to remarry? So one view in church history is that there is no remarriage after divorce. It's a minority position, but many of my favorite people in church history have held that position, that there is no remarriage after divorce. Our view, and this would probably be more the majority view in church history, is that remarriage can follow some divorces. Not all divorces, but some divorces. And here's the way we would summarize what some would mean. Biblical grounds for divorce give biblical grounds for remarriage. Or to say it another way, when divorce is biblically permissible, remarriage is also permissible. So that's how we would see the the remarriage question after a divorce. Okay, now I want to just step back from all that, and I want to apply this to a few uh, sort of groups in the room. First, to our singles. Uh, Let me say this first. I just want to go back to last week and just to look at you again and say, please don't waste your singleness. Your singleness is also a gift from God. And just like marriage shows us something about the gospel, so does your singleness. Singleness is showing something about the sufficiency of Jesus, that he really is enough. So so give Jesus your undivided devotion in your single years. Give him your whole heart. So, So don't waste your singleness. Secondly to singles, choose a spouse wisely. Outside of your decision for Jesus, your decision of a spouse will be the most consequential decision of your life. You're either going to get a little slice of heaven or a little slice of hell in this decision. So choose wisely. And for me, that's not even funny. It is like blood earnest serious because I've seen this happen. That, that's, that is how important that decision is. So make sure that they are chasing after Jesus, that they love Jesus, that they've got good character. And because it's so important that you choose wisely, make sure you choose in community. So if you're dating, right? Dating is connected to marriage. So dating is pairing off for the sake of assessing a person for marriage, right? So so if you're dating, make sure you're doing that in community with people who love you, right? And are wise and can walk beside you to make sure, yes, we think that person loves Jesus too. Yes, we think they have the character needed to be a good spouse to you. Yes to all of those things. You need that. See, part of what love does is blind us, right? It blinds us. So we need people who can see for us Come around us to make sure we're making a wise decision. So singles, choose wisely and choose in community. To all of our married folks in the room. First, I just want to encourage you to stay married. This is one way we tell the truth about Jesus, by staying married. Secondly, cultivate your marriage. So much is riding on your marriage for your kids, for for your own sake, for the sake of Jesus. So much is riding on it. So think about how to cultivate and enrich your marriage. Marriages drift when when they're drifting. They're going to always drift downhill, not uphill. They they never drift toward enrichment. So you have to think about how, how can we cultivate that type of a marriage? What do we need to do in this season of our marriage? Every married couple, I just want to encourage you to to answer this question today. What can we do in this season of our married life to enrich our marriage? What what could we do for that? Now, if you're here today and your marriage is just struggling, I mean, you're even to the point of thinking about divorce, I need you to look at me in the eye. You need to tell someone today about that. You need to get community into your life, not tomorrow, not on Tuesday, but today 
people need to know about that. Here's what so often happens uh, with people in a church environment. Uh, they are thinking about these things. They're in a hard marriage. They're thinking about divorce for a year, two years. And then they make that decision. They bring the church in. And then they want the leaders of the church uh, to understand and, and to be uh, affirm, affirmative of that decision after one conversation. And I just want to look at you and say, that is unrealistic. It's not fair to do that, the people. So, so you need to make sure you are bringing people in right now so that you can get community walking with you, helping you, helping you sort out what would be ways to enrich and help and cultivate your marriage, how to get your marriage back on the, all of those things need to be happening like today. So please do not leave here apart from telling someone. Uh, we have marriage care that's gonna start back up in June. And for so many of us, it would be a good enriching thing for us. It would be a great way to cultivate our marriage. If our marriage is struggling, a good way to get it back on the tracks, that's gonna start in June. A lot of us should be in that, in June, just enriching and helping our marriage. That's to marrieds, now to the divorced in the room. If you are divorced, I, I wanna just say two quick things to you. Number one, you need to be clear on what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. People are, generally speaking, just not equipped well in this area. And if you are divorced, you need to know, you need to do the study, do the work in knowing what the Bible says about this. We wrote a white paper on marriage, divorce, and remarriage to try to help you do that. In a sermon like this, there's just too many situations to try to apply every nuance uh, to, to your situation. But you need to know how the Bible's teaching applies to your situation. So that white paper would help you. We're going to send that out today. And I would just encourage you to make sure you spend time in that. We would be happy to sit down with you to help you think out the ramifications of where you are, what your future, and to all of those things. We would be happy to do that. But make sure you do the work to get clear on that. Second thing I want to say to all of our divorce folks, divorce is not the unforgivable sin. If you are carrying guilt and shame around this morning, I just want to look at you and remind you, the grace of God is big enough for it. It's big enough for you. It's big enough for your divorce. The grace of God is that big. And I'll close with this just to, to help you see how big the grace of God is. Matthew records uh, Jesus' genealogy. It's Jesus' family tree. That's what you get in Matthew chapter 1. And here is one of the first things you're going to notice about Jesus' family tree. There are a whole lot of broken limbs in that tree. There is sexual sin in that tree. There are broken marriages in that tree. Think about David and Bathsheba. David takes another man's wife. He then has that man killed, right? That, that's in, that's in Jesus' family tree. There are prostitutes in that tree. There are abusers in that tree. There are murderers in that tree. There are adulterers in that tree. The, the tree just has broken limbs every, everywhere. Yet, hear this, yet, from those crooked sticks came the Christ. Isn't that amazing? From those crooked, broken limbs came Jesus. And what's the point of that? I love how Tim Keller says it. God can bring beauty and redemption even out of our biggest mistakes if we trust it to him. If we'll trust those mistakes to him, those hardships to him. Friends, that is so true. If, if you'll trust Jesus today, he'll take whatever sin's been done by you and whatever sin has been done to you, and he'll bring redemption and resurrection right there in that place. He'll reshape those things for your eternal good forever. He can do that, church. So would you bow with me there where you are? And I want to spend just a moment here allowing the Lord to press into you what would be most helpful today. What would Jesus want you to hear from him today? If you're married, where is your marriage telling the truth about Jesus? Where is it telling a lie about Jesus? It's not if it's telling a lie, just where is it? today? How open would you be to repenting and coming back home to the Lord in that area?
And friends, here is the beautiful thing about the good news of Jesus. There is an open invitation, which means if you don't know Jesus, today could be your wedding day. And I'm talking about an earthly marriage. I'm talking about the eternal marriage. It could be your wedding day, friend. So if you don't know Jesus today, come to Jesus today. Turn from your sin. Throw your life upon him today. Trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Give your life to him. Friends, we would love to celebrate you entering into the marriage, your wedding with Jesus right now in this moment. So friends, just in the best way you know how, call out to the Lord. So Father, would you come now and meet with us and apply the good news of Jesus in the particular ways you know we need today. And it's in the good name of Jesus that we ask it. Amen.